So, hey everyone, I'm Sam Alkin, and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 food safety office hours. Today, we've got colleagues from the New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets. They're going to be bringing us up to speed on the regulatory updates and happenings regarding fresh produce, dairy processing, and the food and beverage industries here in New York. Now, we'll have plenty to learn from them, and I'm sure you're going to have some questions. Now, COVID is never far from our minds here. And while many of the mandates for mitigation practices are being removed now, like masks, on planes and public transport, this is a reminder that you can still choose to implement them yourself or in your businesses. You know, we're seeing counts beginning to go up, particularly here in New York. We've seen a 66% increase in cases and a 30% increase in hospitalizations over the last two weeks. Is this a new wave or the last fling from spring break? It's not clear, but the point is to be mindful of the cases in your areas and adjust your mitigation practices accordingly. Now, these offices are meant to provide a space to learn, question, and discuss food safety in COVID-19. And to help us on the panel today, we've got Dr. Olga padilla Zakor, who is a professor of food science and the director of the Cornell Food Venture Center at Cornell University. We've got Dr. Martin Weedman, who will be joining us in a little bit, who's a Gellert family professor in food safety and co-director of the New York State Integrated Food Safety Center of Excellence. We've got Tommy Saunders, who is our Produce Safety Alliance Southeast Regional Extension Associate. We've got Dr. Aliosa Trimic, our Dairy Extension Associate and COVID-19 Resource Guru. We have Dr. Ruth Petrin, who's the president of the International Association for Food Production and founder of Ruth Petrin Consulting, with years of experience in identifying and tracking emerging food safety trends and new control strategies. We've got Dr. Callie Neal joining us. She's a professor of microbial food safety in the Department of Animal and Food Sciences at the University of Delaware, where she explores issues of food safety and public health that involve transmission of viruses, protozoa, and pathogenic bacteria. And I'm Sam Alkin, an assistant professor here in the Department of Food Science, where my research focuses on improving dairy quality and safety through fermentation. And now what I'm gonna quickly do is pass it over to Al to give us an update on what's going on on our COVID-19 uh, webpage. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Uh, yes, what we have is, so we added a uh, US government's uh, COVID-19 toolkit uh, that, that can help you um, get all the resources that you need to protect yourself and others specific to your uh, geographic location. Um, under trackers, we added three new, so tracking COVID-19, we added three new um, resources, I guess, COVID-19 trends and cases. Um, specific to different states where you can compare uh, cases and numbers and states in different territories. Another map where you can have a map view of COVID-19 risks uh, for specific uh, counties. And then the third one is, is uh, a map view of test results of wastewater um, results. So, so we're doing wastewater testing because this is an early indication of what we can expect with the cases uh, in, in the future. Uh, so all these can, can be found under uh, tracking COVID-19. Um, one thing that we're going to put on our webpage, but uh, just something to mention, is that uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services just extended the fact that we still are dealing with a public health emergency, which means that uh, some of the, for example, some of the FDA's temporary policies that were put in place will remain in place. So that would be uh, a temporary policy regarding certain labeling requirements, um, uh, temporary policy regarding labeling of shelf eggs and, uh, uh, that are sold in retail establishments, uh, and temporary policy on menu labeling uh, uh, requirements. If I go back, the only part I should also mention under podcasts and webinars, so we have there's going to be the fourth and last uh, webinar on um, um, uh, positioning the, the food supply chain for future uh, crisis. So that's something uh, happening on April 21st, if anybody's interested. Um, and that would be it from my side, Sam. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thanks, Sam. Yeah, no, it's important, right, to have these resources as, as we see, you know, again, uh, mandates and policies kind of shifting down. It's going to put a lot on us as individuals and businesses to stay on top of what's going on uh, with COVID-19. Right now, we're lucky that, you know, 
the major variant right now is not as right uh, as virulent um, and causing severe disease. And now we have vaccines in place, and we have some antiviral uh, you know medications for when people do get sick. But we need to stay on top of this and and pay attention. So please please stay on top of that, and that that's a great resource. Um, and now. Uh, I'd like to welcome our New York Ag and Market uh, colleagues. We have Dan McCarthy, the Director of the Division of Food Safety and Inspection, joining us. We have Saeed Akhtar, who is the Program Manager in the Food Safety and Inspection Division. And we have Casey McHugh, the Director of the Division of Milk Control and Dairy Services. I want to thank you all for being here and bringing us up to speed on what's going on in the food safety world in New York. So I'll pass it over to you, Dan. Thanks. Sorry about that. You think I'd know by now. Uh, I just asking Beth to run the slides for me. I've had connectivity issues all morning, so we're going to use that backup plan. So thank you, Beth. We'll move to the next slide. So let's talk a little bit about what we're going to talk about. So we're going to you know, talk a little bit about what is the Division of Food Safety Inspection and offer some statistics about that. We're going to talk a little bit about the farm product inspection, the produce safety inspection, and of course, like everyone is interested, food safety modernization. Still hear me? I cannot hear you. I, I can hear you. Sorry, I was muted this time. Yes, I can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Beth, can you move the next slide, please? Okay. So, the Division of Food Safety Inspection, we actually regulate over 35,000 establishments around the state with an inspection staff of around 98. So, you can imagine the volume, the depth, and breadth of the things that we look at. Of those 25,000, 12,000 of them are considered food processors. Now, not all of them are manufacturing plants. You know, food processing includes those things that happen at the deli. So if you're slicing a deli, they are counting as food processing. 2,000 more are simply retail, so they don't have that food processing you know, done in the facility. And then, of course, we have, you know, other things we regulate, such as warehouses. We have over 750 of those. We also conduct inspections. Uh, some of them are under contract with the FDA, and in 2021, we did over 300 FDA inspections. And in addition, we did 31,000 other inspections, and that's just on the food safety side. You know, that doesn't count the farm product work and the produce safety work that we also do. And then we send food for testing at the food lab. And in last year, we did over 3,500. You know, Casey will talk about the thousands more that they do, but for 3,500 is a really strong number. Slide. So we license a lot of these entities. Uh, that includes the food processes, retail stores, warehouses. We also salv have salvagers, disposal and transporter slaughterhouses. And yes, if you're an alcohol manufacturer, right, we license you if your license doesn't have the, the farm name in the license. You're essentially processing a food which is alcohol. But if you do have a farm alcohol license, you're exempt from licensing, but not necessarily exempt from an inspection. Right? So what did we find over the last year? Well, routinely we have what we call failing inspections. If we find a critical deficiency, that inspection is considered failing. So 25% of all the inspections we did did have a failing inspection. So we would love to see that improve. Right? We have in those inspections and sampling resulted over 2,100 seizures and it totaled 1.8 million pounds of food that we took off the market because they resulted in something, or a contamination or adulteration, and that was not fit for human. Most recently, we also involved in several investigations uh, with heavy metals and dyes. So there are spices out on that market, and some of those spices have heavy metals and industrial dyes in them. So we have taken those to the food lab, we've confirmed that they have those, and we've taken those spices off the market also. Right? So why is this important? Why are we really doing this? Well, 48 million Americans become ill, that's one in every six, and 3,000 Americans die of foodborne pathogens each year. Uh, that's a huge number. 32 million Americans have food allergies, uh, my son, one of them. So in, that includes 
5.6 million children under 18, and that's one in 13. Now, when I grew up, we didn't have an issue like that, and now it's becoming a really big issue. That's roughly two in every classroom. So what are, what's happening new in this industry? Well, obviously, it's FISMA. So we're switching from the regulatory structure where we're identifying uh, issues during inspection, and we're switching to a more preventative approach. You know, we're looking for policies, procedures, documentation that we're going to avoid foodborne illness and pathogens. That's a big change. Right? So, how about some statistics? So, over a third of the top 50 food and beverage companies have manufacturing plants. They're in those two. Right? So, that's Pepsi, Frito Lay, Cargill, Kraft, HP, Coca Cola, General Mills, and it just goes on and on. Our role in the industry is critically important. It enables these manufacturers that we're inspecting in New York to be involved in interstate and international commerce. Uh, some of these firms rely on the fact that they are inspected to provide information to those other states and those other countries. You know, New York does inspect the plants. We are, you know, taking samples of for commerce. Right? Right? Yes, there is a fee. So for food processing, just so you know, right, if you're not part of a chain or franchise and you have less than full-time employees, it's $175 for a two-year license. Whether or not that's big, but I don't If you don't qualify for the threshold, it's $400 for a two-year license. And if you have a farm-only type of license, I mentioned it from the State Liquor Authority, then you're exempted from the license requirement. Still on? Sorry. Hello? Yeah, we can we hear you, Dan. We hear you. Yep. Okay. Move the slide, Beth. Thank you. <clears throat> so, a couple things you need to, to know about food processing license, right? So, certain firms might also need to have a manager with a food safety education program certificate. That is our assurance that while an inspector is not there, that somebody is trained in food safety and can monitor and maintain that sanitary environment during the food. That doesn't apply if you're a family business or with two or less full-time employees and your annual gross income is less than $3 million. And then we, on our website, we do have a list of many of the programs that can offer a food safety education program certificate. Next slide. It's removed. So, yep. Okay. So, your new applicants will need an initial food safety inspection prior to granting a license. Oops. That's okay. All right. Uh, we we'd love to have your cooperation to uh, arrange that, uh, so that we can get you open and operating as soon as possible. All right. You won't receive your initial license without a passing inspection. Go ahead. You're on the next one. Um, my screen is not showing the next slide. Maybe it's just my screen. I think it is. It's uh, we're on the food safety inspection slide. Okay. All right. Just moved over. Sorry. I think we're we're lagging on my end. So we look for the good manufacturing practices when we're doing inspections. So under personnel, we're looking for disease control, cleanliness, training, and super. Building the ground, obviously, adequate maintenance. Safety operations, that's the cleaning, and that's trying to prevent pests from getting into your operations. Then sanitary controls are the water supply and plumbing. What are those things that you have in place? And of course, equipment design and maintenance is a big part. Uh, we're referring to the, the federal CFR part 117, and there's a link also on this slide. Next. Next slide, what's up? Okay, thank you. So 
So what do we find when we're doing inspections? Unfortunately, we're finding essentially the same kinds of things that are causing the failing inspections. This basic sanitation, the floors, walls, and ceilings is inadequate. I mentioned that it's important to keep the environment clean if you're going to keep the pathogens and filtrants out of your food. Uh, inadequate space for operations. So you need space around your equipment in order to clean them. That's an important part. Equipment not properly cleaned and maintained, that's obvious. Hand washing facilities not properly installed or maintained. So if you don't have hot water, if you access to box, people aren't washing their And then storage areas also clean and good. On top of that, you're going to present a lot of problems. Slide. So, FISMA. So this is where I said it's really transforming how we approach food safety. So there, FISMA has several components. One's the produce safety rules. Heidi talk a little bit about that. All right. We have the human food preventive controls rule, which is in our food safety side. And then we actually have the animal food preventive control rules. Uh, we'll be implementing those too. All right. This is a couple experts excerpts from our website. There's, there's a lot of resources here. If you have specific questions that deal with maybe CBD or halal or kosher or home processing, you know, there's resources for all of those on our website. And there's the website. I see it's in the chat. Um, if you have specific questions, I welcome you going to our website. And you know, looking around, we are probably have a great deal of information on that. All right. All right. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Saeed Akhtar, who is our program manager, and he uh, works with the farm products and produce safety folks. Saeed? My name is Saeed Akhtar, and I am program manager in the Division of Food Safety and Inspection. So, I'll be talking about the two programs, the units in this division, uh, produce safety and farm products. Uh, so, about the produce safety rule, uh, this rule, as you all know, is one uh, part of one of the eight FISMA rules, uh, and New York State has adopted most parts of uh, of the rule by reference. Uh, we conduct the produce safety inspections at farms that grow, harvest, pack, and are hold uh, fresh produce. Uh, the purpose of uh, of this uh, aim of this uh, this rule is to ensure the U.S. food supply is safe by shifting basically the the focus from responding to contamination to preventing it. Next slide, please. So when we started doing inspections in 2019, uh, August 2019 was the first year when we started doing inspections. And that first year, we uh, started inspections on the large covered farms. Then in January 2020, we began inspections on, uh, in addition to the large, we started inspections on small covered farms. And then in, um, in January 2021, uh, we started inspecting very small uh, covered farms. So this year, we would be inspecting all these farms. Uh, up to date, up till uh, last month, we have inspected, um, conducted a total of 432 um, inspections on 340 farms in the New York State. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so th these are the three main findings uh, which have been found so far uh, during these inspections. And the first one is inadequate documentation of cleaning and sanitizing equipment. Uh, number two is the equipment or tools uh, not properly designed or constructed or not maintained and uh, not adequately cleaned or sanitized. And the third is inadequate general record keeping, uh, which may include the, the name of and the location of the farm, actual values of the observations during monitoring, and inadequate uh, information about covered produce or location of growing areas and date and time of the activity observed. So all these three are the main or the major um, deficiencies noted or the findings which have been observed so far. Next slide, please. 
So the Foreign Products Unit uh, of the produce, uh, of the Division of food, uh, food Safety and Inspection does inspection, grading inspections, and auditing. Uh, there are three main programs uh, which are at the bottom of this slide, uh, which is terminal market inspection, shipping point inspection, and good agriculture and good handling practice audits. So these, all these three programs, uh, we operate on delegated authority from USDA, and these uh, services provide a third-party grading and certification and third-party food safety verification audits to the fresh produce industry throughout New York. These programs help buyers and sellers of all sizes in the produce industry to market their perishable products in most efficient way. Now, these services uh, overall benefit the growers, shippers, brokers, receivers, processors, retailers, food service and industry members, and consumers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So this, uh, the market inspections and shipping point inspections basically started in 1917, um, and that is a federal state service. Um, as I said in the earlier uh, slide, this is a delegated authority from USDA, so we operate on behalf of USDA. We are licensed by USDA to inspect uh, produce. Uh, these inspections are performed at fresh produce on terminal market, warehouses, packing houses, etc and terminal market inspection involves inspection of fresh produce coming from other states or countries, and shipping point involves uh, the inspection of New York State grown produce for shipment to other states or countries. So there are two services, terminal market inspections and shipping point inspections. So terminal market basically produce coming into the state and shipping point going out of the state. Uh, all these inspections are based on USDA's official standards for grades uh, of more than 90 uh, fresh fruits and vegetables commodities. Just to give you an idea, last year uh, in 2020 calen 2021 calendar year, we inspected 76 million pounds of produce at the terminal warehouses. Uh, I think we just lost Saeed. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yep. Okay. I know it was automatically muted. But uh, <clears throat> so 76 million pounds of produce was inspected, uh, the produce coming into the state, uh, and 57 million pounds of produce was inspected, um, basically New York State produce, which uh, had to leave the state going to other states or out of the country or overseas. Next slide. Okay, so GAP and GIP, good agriculture practices and good handling practices. This is an audit service which USDA implemented in 2002. And again, this is also uh, a service which we provide on behalf of USDA. We are trained and, um, and licensed by USDA. Uh, we have 16 auditors in, in the state. So voluntary fee-based service, all these services are uh, fee-based. Um, and this, this verifies the implementation of GAP and GAP on the farms. Uh, this audit assists farmers and fresh produce handlers in providing safe, wholesome produce to consumers and meeting buy requirements. Uh, one other great advantage of this GAP and GAP checklist is that um, it supports the compliance with FDA's produce safety rule. And also this program helps producers in marketing their produce and in minimizing microbial contamination of produce from farm to fork. So in uh, 2021 calendar years, um, we conducted 220 audits uh, in New York State uh, farms and warehouses. I think that is all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sayin Dan. We'll pass it over Excellent. to yep. you. Know, yeah, we'll take questions you at hear the me end. Okay? Yep. Yes, we can. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Great to see so many familiar names out there. 
uh, appreciate the ability to present. Uh, we do enjoy popping the hood, if you will, on our programs uh, to show you a little bit behind the scenes, kind of what makes us tick our goals, objectives, uh, versus just our boots on the ground that show up and, and work with you uh, for us on the milk control and dairy services side. Uh, almost like a resident inspector, if you will, with those every 90 day uh, inspection frequencies, as well as every month sampling. So uh, I'm just going to walk through here and uh, show you and, and teach you a little bit about milk control and dairy services. So we're, we're going to take a little history lesson to begin, uh, talk about just kind of uh, describe what we are, who we are, probably some arms that you're not as familiar with. Uh, especially on the dairy services side, uh, some program industry facts specifically uh, about the, the dairy industry uh, that's going on right now, uh, depending on time here, I'll hope to uh, elaborate a little bit. Uh, FISMA, what that means to us in dairy as we created our own little FISMA island, I'll talk about that. Emerging issues and then the questions at the end. So uh, quick here, just the, the history lesson itself, uh, for those of you that are familiar, you know, with with our FIA, some of us went to Gr uh, Greece in, in the beginning there, so it just kind of has a, kind of a funny little. Uh, when we talk history, that's for many of us that that saw the world a little bit more through work. Uh, the, the Greece story is a good one, but but milk control and dairy services, what is that, right? So 1884. We were the Dairy Commission, the agency. Ag and Markets was the Dairy Commission. And then in 1914, Foods and Markets, uh, 26 Reorg, and uh, the agency was renamed to the current name Department of Agriculture and Markets. So it all started with the Dairy Commission. Just a little bit of who we are and what we do, right? We're involved of, of all aspects of the industry. We license, we inspect, we sample. Uh, we take care of the state milk marketing orders. Uh, we have a Western New York order uh, that's very unique. Uh, that's run as a state run order. If many of you are familiar with the federal milk marketing orders. We're order one in the Northeast. Uh, then the implementation of dairy promotion activities that involves the dairy promotion order, uh, $15.3 million that, that uh, uh, through contracts for promotion and research. And then uh, just the next bullet talks about our goals and objectives, which is uh, much aligned with uh, food safety. It's protecting public health. And then we also have an obligation to promote agricultural economic development uh, to keep a vibrant dairy industry. Uh, just quick on the dairy services side, uh, Deputy Commissioner Jennifer Trodden is who we report to. Uh, my assistant director, Heather Torino, and then we have a program manager, and then just kind of the bureaus under the, the dairy services arm. Uh, we have an economist, program research specialist, then you get into licensing and auditing. We have an auditor that takes care of that aspect of functionality, then the Western New York milk marketing uh, order. Uh, Ron George just retired. Uh, we hired David Borkowski. Ron George, 44 years in that position for us. Uh, just a role model of an employee. Eats, breathes, uh, sleeps the Western New York milk marketing order. Uh, Dan, like food safety, every state agency and division has their own map. We're broken into seven regions. Uh, we have 34 DPSs, dairy product specialists. Uh, then the regional supervisors are dairy product specialist twos. We have an equipment specialist, a FISMA interstate milk shippers lead, and then a compliance enforcement uh, member of staff in the office and, and a program manager for a total staff of 45 on uh, the milk control side. This is clearly not to be read. It is just to show you uh, where all of our establishments are, they are in black. And then uh, Dan had the cool dots. I don't have the dots big on my map yet. So with only, you know, 350 establishments, it's much easier to manage. Uh, the red is where we're located. Uh, the biggest thing is just, you can see up in the North Country, there's the, the Adirondack Park vacuum, as you can imagine. Uh, but then you see a lot of uh, establishments down the Hudson Valley, Finger Lakes, 
uh, around a lot of the more metropolitan uh, areas, uh, cities, et cetera. Uh, just we are so blessed with a diversity of, of uh, processors in the state. And, and uh, you know, you can be a one day in a very small artisanal cheese facility and the next day you are standing in an absolute mega plant that's, you know, processing in excess of two and a half million pounds of milk per day. And as you can imagine, as a regulator, that technical knowledge and, and understanding of, of all of that is that's on us as well. So uh, just quick milk production across the top 10 states. Uh, we're fifth now, and and uh, we got surpassed by Idaho a few years ago, and then we just got surpassed by Texas last year. There's a lot of farms pulling out of California and, and are settling and starting up in Texas. It's going to be interesting to watch uh, weather-wise, water especially, uh, how that's all going to pan out long term. Uh, but we're still uh, New York, you know, million pounds of milk produced. Uh, for 2021, 15.5 uh, uh, billion pounds. Uh, and then further, because we don't have uh, the USDA's numbers out yet for 2021, this just gives you a little bit of idea of our milk shed. Uh, important to highlight just our, our uh, you know, top five dairy counties in this state. Truly, that's where, you know, there, there's a lot of milk, as you can see, Wyoming and Cayuga. Uh, compared to uh, three down to 10. Uh, so farm numbers, right? Everyone has seen a reduction in farm numbers, but our milk production has uh, continued to hold its own or increase. Um, New York's averaging about 625,000 dairy cows, producing an average of 24,500 pounds each. Talk a little bit more about that as we get going. And then just our overview, we're first in cream cheese, first in cottage cheese, first in yogurt, second in sour cream. Uh, but but please don't forget, we we produce a massive amount of other products uh, in, in, you know, cheddar cheese, et cetera. We may not be first or second in those, but but we produce a, a high amount and, and uh, are very fortunate, again, with a diversity, uh, very high end niche type products as well. So uh, we're, we're, we're very excited to, uh, to keep up with all of that innovation. And, and then this just wraps it all in. Why is this important, right? 6% of the population in New York, 17% Northeast, and almost 60% uh, East of the Mississippi. That, that's truly who we're serving, uh, really serving the globe. Uh, I sign certificates of free sale for product that's leaving this country, and, and we move product all over the place. Uh, just again, in the statistics, our licenses processor, which is our part two permit, zero dollars. Yes, folks, there are state licenses and, and permits that are zero dollars. Uh, milk receiver, zero. Lab techs, uh, no charge. Certified milk inspector, also processing plant superintendent. Many of you are, are may wear that hat. And then on the milk dealer side, that's the licensing arm for all of those that are utilizing more than 3,000 pounds of milk per month. Uh, it can go up to $7,500. So that's for clearly those that there's a sliding scale on that that are using a massive amount of milk. Uh, that includes plant operator under the milk dealer tag, uh, cooperatives, uh, brokers, distributors, and milk haulers. And a lot of those are just the, you know, $100 license. Just the breakdown of us uh, for our stats of who we regulate, uh, almost 350. Obviously, those numbers there add up to more than that. And that's because uh, many processing plants also do wholesale frozen desserts. And then the 61 raw milk permits down there, that number has grown. When I came in the office in 06, I believe there was 10 or less than 10. Uh, just getting into our inspections, uh, 7,000 inspections annually. We wanted to go back and take a little snapshot over our uh, inspection uh, passing rate uh, pre-COVID, I guess, uh, and then seeing if we had an impact there. Uh, every 90 days, right, is, is the dairy inspection frequency very prescriptive in nature for those that are familiar with our regs and the pasteurized milk ordinance. Um, so, so we have a high, always would like to see that number higher, 
um, but but that covers uh, you know uh, 84, 89, and then back to 84 in 2021. And then most frequented debits, uh, milk plant cleanliness, 71%, floors, 60, equipment construction, 57, and protection from contamination, also at 57%. Sampling the dairy programs across the nation uh, under that reciprocal uh, pasteurized milk ordinance, uh, a lot of samples, 15,000 for us that are sent to the New York State Food Laboratory, the big joke for those that are around me a lot, I always say it should be called the milk lab, um, but very high compliance rate on bacteria samples. Uh, the chemical samples, just to help folks out with that, that's, you know, fat moisture, label claims, that type of thing. Um, and so uh, that that's, has a, a lower uh, compliance rate, uh, often working with folks to ad address their labels, uh, label claims, uh, things of that nature. But all the way through, you can see uh, pretty high compliance rates uh, and, and model quite well year to year. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of kind of my world a little bit more on a national level. So 21 CFR 117, uh, I am chair of the NCIMS liaison committee. We aligned uh, with all of the, the delegates at the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shippers, uh, the Appendix T, which is full 21 CFR 117 compliant. And uh, we had identified early on many of facilities out there also do non-grade A uh, that falls outside of the PMO. So we are currently piloting a non-grade A, grade A approach uh, to the dairy industry that is ever evolving as we learn more and more about FDA's implementation of FSMA, uh, the limited scope uh, you can you can Google that, read about that. There's stuff online about the limited scope approach that is is kind of changing the way we're looking at the way many states and our pilot was going to be built. So I would just say stay tuned uh, as far as uh, that pilot goes. It, it's going to be changing as of the last couple of weeks. So we're we're going to be taking a new trajectory on that one. Uh, this one, I guess, is is probably where I want to focus here for this presentation, right? We, we've just got, we've seen a lot of, uh, in the reportable food registry, the RFR, there's been a lot of specifically in frozen desserts, uh, allergen recalls uh, across the nation. Uh, we've had, as of recently, uh, there is a sanitizer and finished product, uh, school milk, was a couple of those situations. These are public knowledge. These are right off of FDA's uh, website. So we, as a division, are going to be focusing and sitting down with all of our plant operators to discuss what their protocol and procedure is. I mean, that is just something that you wouldn't think would, would be popping up on the radar screen for, for as long as we've done this. Um, but we're we're taking a fresh look at it. We've we've reached out to, to the Cornell Dairy Extension folks as well to make sure that you know we we have the latest and greatest and and most uh, feasible approach. So uh, more on that. And then Coronabacter uh, folks uh, that have seen this Abbott that the, the company again. I'm not using anyone's name in vain. This is all public off of FDA's website. Uh, they had to recall a bunch of infant formula powder. Uh, they have their own plant uh, where this Coronabacter was found. This has been discussed by FDA in the past. I think it's safe to say there will be more of those discussions uh, that will come up uh, regarding this uh, uh, pathogen for, for powder plants. Um, but it's definitely on the radar screen, I think, nationally and internationally. Um, just this is our website. Uh, the address is down on the bottom. And, um, you know, anyone has any questions, please always reach out to us. Uh, we love to talk about what we do and, and, and clarify, or if there's questions on regulations, we, we try to be very user friendly and get out there. If someone's, you know, contemplating a build or a expansion, we, we sit down 
early on and, and, and make sure that everyone at the table is well aware and, and we work along with folks so that there's no surprises at the last minute that we show up and say, have to say, I'm sorry, that can't be approved. That's a bad day. We consider that a failure uh, because we like to get with everyone and communicate and discuss every step of the way. So I guess with that, I would say thank you. That is our staff at our annual training update. And uh, we've got a great group. I'm sure many of you work with them and uh, ever changing, lots of retirements, lots of new additions. We put on 13 folks uh, this year, the most we've ever put on and are very excited about that and, and excited about the caliber of individual that came to us. So with that, I will stop and turn it back over for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Casey. And thank you, Dan and Saeed.